Hello and warmest welcome. We are live from Anan Clinics. My name is Donna Lawani, and I work in clinical outreach with many of our clinicians and professionals. With me are Sandlin Lowe, physician at the Amen Clinics New York, and Karen Mayo, integrative nutrition and lifestyle coach, who I'll introduce shortly. We're presenting on bright minds and mindful eating for brain health. Amen Clinics is a global leader specializing in functional imaging, utilizing brain spect. We aim to look at the underlying or root cause of clients presenting symptoms. The clinics were established more than 30 years ago by Dr. Daniel Amen, world-renowned clinical neuroscientist, double board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist, professor, and 10-time New York Times bestselling author. There are nine Amen clinics across the United States. Amen clinics have one of the highest published success rates for treating complex psychiatric issues. And the Amen clinics have the world's largest database of functional brain scans relating to brain and behavior. More than 180,000 scans on patients from over 122 countries. Typically, we incorporate detailed clinical assessments and histories in our evaluation process, even blood workup and labs. Our clinics embody a brain-based integrative approach to evaluation and targeted treatment, working with children through adults of all ages. It's National Mental Health Awareness Month, and for us, every day is important for brain health. Today, as we present on Bright Minds and 11 major risk factors, we can see the science-backed approach in mental health and support for mood, memory, and address aging we will discuss with our brain systems lens, mindful eating and brain healthy vitamins and supplements, minerals to help you. And you can also consider your own unique brain health type, what to look for, how to optimize your brain health and understand the food mood connection. We appreciate being part of this journey together with you, your clients and families. So let's introduce our speakers. Dr. Sandlin Lowe is our first presenter and then followed by Karen Mayo. We invite you to stay here with us for Q&A session at the end. I invite you to add your questions into the chat feature. First, in introducing Dr. Sandlin Lowe, he's a neuropsychiatrist and expert in translational clinical neuroscience and therapeutics, working as a physician in the New York Clinic. As a former trauma surgeon, Dr. Lowe utilizes proven diagnostic and treatment successes, which Dr. Amen and the Amen Clinics are internationally known for. He has special interests in PTSD, subtypes of anxiety, ADD, major depression, thalamocortical dysrhythmias, as well as treating traumatic brain injuries, cognitive impairment, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism spectrum disorders, just to name a few. Dr. Lowe has previously served at NYU School of Medicine's Department of Psychiatry, Physiology, and Neuroscience, consulted as a neuropsychiatrist to NYU School of Medicine's Brain Research Laboratories and NYU Langone Center for Neuromagnetism. He completed his medical degree at Tulane University. So thank you, Dr. Lowe, for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank and you. Thank you. Karen Mayo is here with us as well. She's an award-winning international best-selling author of Mindful Eating. Karen has guided thousands of people to losing inches, pounds, and medications through better eating and healthy habits. As a natural whole food chef, Karen fulfills her passion of partnering with people who are committed to improving their health and lifestyle and for their families. She's board certified in integrative nutrition, health, and a lifestyle coach a member of the American Association of Drugless Practitioners, certified in fitness and sports nutrition as a specialist by the National Strength and Fitness Association. She's also double certified in corporate wellness by Vital Advantage and Kelly Wellness, certified in hormone health and autoimmune disorders by AATDP, and certified in brain health by Dr. Daniel Amen and Amen University. She has a private practice specializing in effective lifestyle changes to help our clients with more energy, sleep better, become confident in all areas of life. And she's like corporate and wellness workshops, individual health and nutrition coaching. Having been seen on the Dr. Oz show, TEDx stage, Jack Canfield show, XM, Sirius Radio, Columbia University teaching, and working with more than for many of the Fortune 500 companies. 
So Karen, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Well, let's walk through the bright minds. As many of you know, many of these risk factors, almost all of them are preventable and treatable. So we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Lowe. And as again, we do that, I'm gonna mark into the chat. I'm gonna ask you as well to put in your questions. We'll be addressing those at the end for the Q&A. So we'll let you kick off, Dr. Lowe. Thank you for being here. Okay, it's my pleasure. Dude. So um, when we started thinking about the memory rescue program, uh, Dr. Amen came up with these 11 risk factors and this very interesting monomic, bright minds. And each one of these letters stands for an important risk factor. Uh, and then the more we looked at this, it's not only for, for, for memory and, and cognitive issues, but just overall brain health and function to begin with. So let's start with B for uh, the first letter, um, blood flow. B stands for blood flow. Now, blood flow is crucial. Um, in a healthy SPECT scan, uh, which is what we're looking at here on the, the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the blood flow is just beautiful. It's smooth, it's even. Um, what we're looking at here, these, these colors don't really matter. They're just there to help us with depth perception and topography. And these are typically the four views of the brain that we uh, look at um, when we do the SPECT scans. These are the surface scans. These are cortical surface scans. So we're looking at activity of all the surfaces of your uh, brain as measured by uptake of the radio tracer. And uh, the four views, basically the upper left view is looking from underneath, that always reverses left and right. Uh, the um, right view, upper right, would be looking at your brain from the right side. The bottom left is looking at your brain from the left side. And the bottom right is looking straight down on the top of your brain. So this is, this is pretty much what a healthy brain looks like. Now, when we think about um, low blood flow, um, we see that all the time in brain imaging. And it's probably the number one uh, predictor of Alzheimer's. And I have to say, we get a, a big head start on um, predicting uh, Alzheimer's dementia and other types of dementia. Um, and you can see in this uh, uh, scan behind me, behind this um, writing is, um, you know, this is a, a person who has Alzheimer's dementia and, and they just have all kinds of uh, decreases in blood flow and activity in their brain. And this is a much better view actually. What we're doing here is we're comparing a healthy brain on the left with a person who has Alzheimer's. Now Alzheimer's on spec is always a back to front progression. If you look at the bottom left uh, picture and the upper right picture, um, you'll see that it starts in the occipital lobes uh, and as it moves forward into the parietal lobes, it's, it's usually bilateral, it's symmetrical uh, most of the time, and uh, it's, it, it, it uh, tends to be worse occipitally. And as you move through the parietal lobes and forward, it, it tends to improve a little bit. Um, it always spares Brodmann area 19, which is all the way down at the bottom of the, the, the uh, right corner, and that's the visual cortex, okay? So this is pretty classic example of Alzheimer's and, and how blood flow uh, is, is really a, a very important um, uh, aspect of, um, of you know, our um, evaluation of function in people. Um, the next uh, letter is R uh, and that stands for retirement and aging strategies. Um, you know, uh, one of the worst things you can do is to uh, retire and, and just become a couch potato uh, or retire and stop going out and being social. You know, we always want people um, when they retire to have a real plan about, well, OK, you're going to retire. What are you going to do now? Um, so we don't want you being sedentary. We want you to be active and moving. You know, as Newton says, a, a body at rest tends to remain at rest, a uh, body in motion tends to remain in motion. So, so we want people to, to live an active uh, lifestyle, not only physically, but socially. I mean, uh, uh, far, you know, the people who just kind of shut down and stop going out and stop being sociable and stop uh, you know, being uh, physically active, they, they tend to not do well. Okay, so we wanna have a good strategy for retirement. Um, the next letter is um, 
um, uh, well, well, here we're looking at brains. Uh, you know, here's a healthy 35 year old, here's someone at 55, and here's someone uh, in their 80s. So you can see that, um, you know, if we don't um, take care, um, our brains can really deteriorate. And uh, um, there are ways to totally avoid that. The next letter is I, which stands for inflammation. Um, we see a, a tremendous amount of inflammation in uh, the autistic kids. Uh, they have a, a, a uh, an imbalance of pro-inflammatory cytokines in their brains. But there are other conditions that can cause that. You've, you've heard of um, autoimmune encephalitis, uh, pandas disease can do that. But um, people who have other uh, inflammatory diseases, they, they actually affect your brain, psoriasis, eczema. Uh, a lot of these pro-inflammatory cytokines that are produced from, say, um, gut conditions. If, if my microbiome in my gut is not right, if I'm not eating the right foods, or if I'm eating foods that my gut and my immune system are having um, issues with, that inflammation can occur and it can affect our, um, our brains in a very negative way. Um, so what are some information uh, markers that we like to look at? We look at C-reactive protein. We look at homocysteine. We look at the omega-3 index. The omega-3 index is a measure of how much um, uh, icosopentanoic acid, or EPA, and how much uh, docosohexanoic acid, or DHA, are in your red blood cell <coughs> membranes. Now, in the United States, the reference range is about three to five. In uh, individuals with autism or attention deficit disorder, it tends to be on the lower side. Um, autistic kids often have a one to two omega-3 index. And when you compare that to say a country like Japan, where the average index is uh, nine to 10, uh, you, can, you can see that these things are, are variable according to your diet and your nutrition. Uh, so there's no, no reason not to have a, a good healthy omega-3 index. And we do that by eating lots of good quality fish and other foods that contain omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, and taking a, a good quality um, omega-3 um, uh, supplement. Other uh, inflammatory markers, uh, you know, we just saw a picture there of somebody with uh, um, some uh, um, eczema, psoriasis uh, activity. And then, uh, you know, people who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other problems with their joints can also um, be a marker for that. Uh, the G in Brightman stands for genetics, including epigenetics. Um, you know, uh, your, 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 uh, your hereditary markers are, you know, are often given to you by your parents, but the epigenetics um, come from your um, great-grandparents and even your great-great-grandparents. Um, we're seeing epigenetic risk factors now um, up into the fourth generation. Um, so if you've got family members with um, dementing uh, uh, processes or Alzheimer's, then you need to be aware of that. There's uh, some very sophisticated testing now that's being done to kind of um, <clears throat> assess you for these risk factors. And, um, you know, it's something that we often will, will do and people that we're, we're worried about. Um, and as as we say, you know, this is not a death sentence, you know, it's a wake up call. So people who actually have genetic risk factors have to um, really um, work much harder to prevent or slow down the process, but it is uh, uh, doable. Head trauma, this is one of my favorites. I played football in Alabama and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people play contact sports. Um, uh, if you play contact sports, you are much more likely to develop dementia than people who don't play contact sports. And by that, I mean football, rugby, hockey, even soccer, when people head the ball, boxing. Uh, these are all, you know, uh, 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 snowboarding, uh, skiing, things that you would think are not that bad. You know, oh, I wear a helmet when I snowboard, but the helmet really doesn't protect your brain. It only protects your, your skull. Um, what happens is uh, the, the neurologist just published a paper recently showing that if you have just one concussion, it more than doubles your risk for dementia later on in life. 
And, and what happens is people often develop a misalignment of their base of their skull with their uh, first and second cervical vertebra. On the, on the right here, you can see this big hole in the bottom of this uh, skull. That's the foramen magnum. That's where your brainstem exits your skull to become your spinal cord. And your skull sits on top of uh, the atlas and the uh, axes, these two first cervical vertebra. And, and what happens is when you have a misalignment, it interferes with the normal flow of the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, so this whole um, uh, syndrome called craniocervical syndrome uh, has been coined by uh, Dr. Raymond Demadian and Dr. Scott Rosa. They have some very interesting YouTube videos if you wanna um, take a look at Dr. Scott Rosa's work or Dr. Raymond Demadian's work and you'll see um, um, you know, what they're talking about. It turns out that the normal circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid is the major way your brain detoxifies itself. So what happens is if you have this problem, the toxic proteins build up, the two worst ones are tau and the uh, beta amyloid protein, and it affects the hippocampus. The hippocampus is hugely important uh, in memory. There are two of them. Uh, they're in the uh, temporal lobes. Um, plays a, 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 the hippocampus usually doesn't come online until about age three or four. This is why we have trouble remembering things um, that happened to us when we were one or two years old. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see there's some, uh, 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 you know, this is what typical head trauma looks like in some of the spec images that we see. And then we have some uh, football players that we looked at um, on the next slide that um, you can really see the damage there, okay? So um, we did a study um, looking at um, retired professional football players and um, you know they had some of the worst brains I think we'd ever seen. And uh, well, after uh, kind of looking at this, we um, put together a, a, a holistic um, uh, functional integrative program for them that involved lifestyle changes uh, losing weight, improving their nutrition, uh, and, and getting them on the proper supplements. And some of them we used um, hyperbaric oxygen treatments and uh, just saw not only remarkable improvements in their cognitive and functional abilities, but also remarkable improvements in their actual um, spec brain images. So this was a, a major study um, Dr. Eamon did. Um, we saw, uh, for instance, an 80% improvement in memory, attention, mood, and, and sleep. And uh, this was one of the papers that uh, came out of that, reversing brain damage in former NFL players. Um, and, and this was um, one of the first uh, big studies to look at this. And I think this study largely um, uh, helped uh, push the NFL to get more serious about their concussion protocols and, and you know, making sure these uh, players are better protected and treated. Okay, next slide, sorry. Uh, toxins, uh, toxins are everywhere. Um, in the autistic kids, again, we see that they have leaky guts and a lot of toxins come through their guts uh, their, their gut mucosa, and uh, these toxins love to take up residence in the phospholipid bilayer of your uh, cell membranes. Every cell in your body is surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer. Every organelle within the cell is surrounded, and the lipid portion of that bilayer is the favorite place for toxins to accumulate. And uh, if enough toxins accumulate, they can alter um, ion channels, um, this is one of the theories we think um, that in some individuals uh, trigger, the toxins trigger the development of these thalamocortical dysrhythmias that we see. Um, these are based on abnormal uh, T-channel functions and, and you know, T-type calcium channel function in the thalamus. Uh, this is what a toxic brain looks like. We see these on uh, SPECT imaging. Um, there's uh, um, you know, tox toxic imaging, uh, you know, the scalloping and the dimpling that we see is, is uh, often nonspecific, but it's a signal to start looking for um, 
you know, uh, what's causing this. Um, almost everyone we see is low on vitamin D, but we always worry when we see a brain like this, we worry about mold, we worry about Lyme disease, we worry about heavy metals. Uh, there's just a multitude of, of things that can cause this. If you're eating food that your gut and your immune system is reacting to, you get this kind of inflammatory, toxic um, state, you know, look, look on your brain. So um, these are, these are, and, and there are ways to test for these things. Um, uh, so fortunately, we have probably the finest group of uh, functional and integrative medicine doctors in the country. And we often, um, you know, call on them to help us uh, out in these kinds of situations. Uh, next slide. So risk factors for um, toxins. Well, you know, um, as Dr. Amon says, uh, uh, avoid bad and do good. So uh, smoking, uh, the nicotine is, is not good. And, you know, when we're talking about smoking, we're talking about marijuana also. And there's a huge rush to legalize marijuana and pretend that marijuana is not harmful. But the THC uh, in marijuana is very toxic for your brain. Uh, when you think about cannabis, there are two uh, types. There's, a, there's the, um, uh, the, the marijuana, which has a tremendous amount of THC. Um, <clears throat> I mean, some of the marijuana plants have as much as 38% content of THC and very low cannabidiol. Uh, and then there's hemp, which has very little THC and very high cannabidiol. We use a lot of cannabidiol in children with autism. About 35% of children with autism develop a seizure disorder. And cannabidiol has been so effective that one of the pharmaceutical companies has come out with a new um, anti-seizure drug called Epidiolex, which is just pure pharmaceutical grade uh, cannabidiol. Um, as you can see here, all of these uh, substances, uh, particularly in people who are abusing them, um, alcohol, cocaine, and uh, heroin, any illicit drug is going to cause uh, these kinds of damages to your brain. So you just, again, you just really want to avoid this. You know, as, as Dr. Amen says, alcohol is not a health food. Okay. Um, so basically your brain's history is not your destiny, but you have to, you know, first of all, you have to find out what's going on, which means you have to look. Uh, as, as Dr. Amen says, how do you know if you don't look? You have to look and then you have to be willing to do something about it. Uh, you have to be consistent. You need to um, really work on developing the kind of discipline and spirit and consistency, uh, you know, to, to make your brain uh, function better. And, and have a better um, life, okay? Because your brain function determines the quality of your life. Next, okay. So mental health risk factors. Well, we're always worried about chronic stress. Uh, we're worried about emotional trauma and grief and depression and bipolar disorder and even um, attention deficit disorder. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, anyone who has a, a mental health issue is at increased risk, okay? Um, uh, one of the biggest problems is early emotional traumatization, okay? Um, as we said, your hippocampus comes on a line at about age three to four, but your amygdala, which is the part of your brain, there are two of them, they're deep in your temporal lobes, uh, they're very close to the hippocampus. The amygdala is operational at the eighth month of intrauterine life, and the job of the uh, uh, amygdala is to encode, um, you know, uh, experiences uh, and, and memories, uh, particularly emotionally traumatizing uh, memories. And the amygdala plays a big role in the landscaping of the brain. Um, um, uh, we, we now know that the amygdala um, is connected to a nucleus in the brain called the bed nucleus, the BED, and it's uh, connected through the stria terminalis. And so when we have early childhood trauma, um, this is uh, uh, communicated to the bed nucleus, which then plays a major role in what we call the landscaping of the brain. So people who have early um, childhood trauma um, or early life stress, as it's come sometimes called, um, they, they are much more likely to be susceptible to, to future emotional trauma and um, you know they have a what we what Dr. Rudin calls a very permissive 
uh, landscape. If you if you want to read more about this, um, you should look at some of Ronald Rudin's work. He wrote a wonderful book called um, When the Past is Always Present. And he pioneered a technique called havening to treat this. And his website's just www.havening, like a safe haven, H-A-V-E-N-I-N-G dot um, O-R-G. And uh, I have to tell you that that Havening treatment is just amazing when it comes to treating um, not only um, emotionally, uh, past emotional traumas, but, but it's uh, amazing for post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, next slide. Um, oh, this is something we run into a lot. Is it depression or dementia? So here's an elderly person who's depressed and uh, the depression wasn't really recognized because there's such cognitive impairment and the family's focusing on that and they get taken to the neurologist and they get diagnosed with dementia and they get put on Aricept or Namenda. And you really have to be careful with Aricept. There's certain um, genotypes that the Aricept can actually make the dementia worse. Um, so now grandpa's on uh, Aricept and Namenda or grandma's on Aricept and Namenda with the diagnosis of dementia when it really was depression. There is a pseudo dementia of depression. And when you treat the depression, the, um, the dementia, the so-called dementia goes away because it was a pseudo dementia. It was the um, result of the depression. And one of the things brain spect is really good at is helping to distinguish between these two, okay? Next slide. So uh, now we're into the eye. So we're talking about immunity and uh, infections. Um, you know, there, uh, we, uh, Dr. Amon sent us a map of uh, the distribution of Lyme disease in the Northeastern United States. And then he sent a map of the distribution of schizophrenia in the Northeastern United States. And the, these two maps literally superimpose on top of each other. Now I'm not saying everyone who has schizophrenia has Lyme, I'm not saying everyone who has Lyme has schizophrenia, but it's certainly a huge correlation. And our own um, you know, um, story about this is years ago, Chris Christofferson was diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, it was at a very famous clinic in, at uh, UCLA and was pretty much told, oh, you know, this is, this is, this is gonna um, really, um, lead to your demise, you, you essentially you need to start divesting yourself of uh, your, your properties and things and, and get ready. And uh, so someone suggested that he should um, get a second opinion. So he came down to see Mark Philiday, who's our head of uh, functional and integrative medicine. And it turns out he had Lyme disease. And when Mark treated him for the Lyme disease, the so-called Alzheimer's went away. Now this just goes to show you Lyme has become the great imitator. When I was uh, in medical school, it was syphilis and Lyme disease is now the great imitator. And it's interesting because they're both um, spirochetes, both the Lyme uh, bug and the syphilis bug and spirochetes. Uh, next slide. Uh, neurohormone deficiencies. The biggest one has to be the thyroid hormone. There's such a uh, amazing uh, correlation between low thyroid and depression. Um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, we see someone who's chronically depressed. They've been on a many, many different medications. They've tried many different regimens. And, uh, you know, we talk to them about their thyroid and they say, well, doctor, my thyroid's normal. But it turns out all they did was look at the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is almost always uh, within the reference range. So what we do, we don't even, I don't even waste time looking at the TSH anymore. I just look at the free T3 and the free T4. And I can't tell you how many people we've found who um, were depressed and their free T3 or their free T4 were like in the basement of the so-called reference range. So what we do then is we put them on a little bit of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy like Armour thyroid or Nature Thyroid. Uh, or NP thyroid. And when we get the, um, the hormones up into the upper, th upper third of the reference range, they're so much better. A lot of times they can just throw the antidepressant in the trash. Um, we're always worried about testosterone. Uh, we check it in women and men. 
Um, your estrogen and progesterone, a lot of women, um, you know, when they become perimenopausal or postmenopausal, they start having problems with their estrogen and progesterone. Certainly anyone who's had, um, you know, surgery or ovaries removed, you want to, you want to look at these things. The, these, these hormones are very important in boosting blood flow, uh, which also affects your brain. And, uh, um, you know, the DHA um, helps fight aging, but also as a precursor for other hormones. So these are just some of the basic hormones we want to look at that, that have, um, you know, major consequences for uh, brain health and brain function. Uh, next slide. Diabesity. Okay. So this is a, I think this is a neologism that Dr. Heyman coined but it's a combination of diabetes and obesity, okay? And uh, I read a statistic uh, just recently that 50% of patients in the United States of America are obese, okay? Um, well, what's the cause of that? Well, the biggest culprit is American wheat. If you look at what we've done to our wheat, it's criminal. Uh, we are, we're having an epidemic of obese, well, overweight, obese and super obese people, as well as type two diabetes. Um, we used to call it adult onset diabetes, but now we see it in sixth graders, these little obese and super obese sixth graders. So we went back to calling it type two diabetes. And when you look at the meal plans of these children, every single meal has wheat in it, or uh, including the snacks. So, you, you know, um, the, the problem with American wheat is the glycemic index is so high now. Um, I, I mean, the, the glycemic index of wheat is higher than the glycemic index of table sugar. So the glycemic index is the measure of how quickly something gets converted to glucose. There's something wrong when that pretzel or that piece of bread or that pasta that's made with American wheat gets converted to glucose more quickly than my table sugar. Um, this leads to uh, you know an overshoot of insulin, which leads to insulin resistance, and and uh, you know insulin is the fat storage hormone. So uh, you know the calories that now I'm taking in are are much more likely to be stored as fat. You know so, and I don't know why more physicians aren't really talking about this. The other culprit is um, dairy products, uh, pasteurized animal milks, uh, and dairy products made from them. They increase. Uh, the production of human insulin growth factor type one, which predisposes you to type two diabetes. But if you go out throughout America, the two things people get when they go to the store are what? Milk and bread. I mean, and no human being should be eating milk or bread in the United States, at least made from American wheat. Sleep, hugely important. Um, uh, only in 2012 was the uh, uh, glymphatic system discovered. Uh, the brain has an entirely different lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is that system in your body that plays a major role in eliminating waste. And the glymphatic system only operates at night when you're asleep. I mean, I'm 65 all my life. I've wondered why is sleep so important. Now I know. It's the only time the glymphatic system works. So uh, it works best in stage three sleep, which is a pure um, delta wave sleep. In fact, the delta waves actually play a role in, in, um, in improving the function of uh, the glymphatic system. So this is why people who um, don't sleep well, people with sleep apnea, they're much more likely to develop dementia than people who get uh, good quality sleep. So uh, anytime you're having insomnia or your loved one tells you, you know what, you stop breathing when you're asleep, you need to go get a sleep study. You know? Um, we don't like uh, certain sleeping aids because they often uh, can be very addicting and uh, uh, they often cause more trouble than they're worth. We, we, we really want to have a much more natural approach to sleep. And it starts with sleep hygiene. You want to make sure the room is dark enough and, uh, you know, the temperature needs to be good. The bed needs to be comfortable. Um, you know, we want to avoid screen time. Um, all these devices emit a certain frequency of blue light, which uh, totally disrupts melatonin metabolism, and that can really interfere with your sleep. One of the things we've noticed is that the, um, the, the kids who are having more screen time because school's online, they're all having uh, more and more problems with their sleep. I, I've seen this in my own kids. You know, it's like 
it's like midnight and my kids are still awake. I'm like, guys, we need to go to sleep. And they're like, oh, we're just not sleeping. So and it's all this screen time. So, um, you know, we need to get these blue filter, blue light filters and put them on our um, devices and, and try and avoid uh, screen time. If you're having problems sleeping, Dr. Amel will tell you no screen time for at least an hour to 90 minutes before you go to sleep. But we're all guilty of, you know, the, what's the last thing we do before we go to sleep? We check our cell phones, see if we have any messages or you know, any, any tax, so, um, we just need to, you know, avoid that. Okay, next slide. All right, that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Lowe. We My pleasure. Aaron Mayo, uh, take over from here. So I'll let you share your slides. Thanks so much. And again, at this time, if you have other questions that you'd like to put in the Q&A, feel free to do that. We'll answer it following the talk. Wait. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna go from here. So, hello everyone. Um, okay, so mindful eating for brain health. So I just wanna go from uh, the frontal lobe right here. So that's where we have the ability to concentrate, to make decisions, uh, to put things in order, the ability to speak and write and behavior control. So that's right here in the prefrontal. So next we're gonna to go to the temporal lobe, right? So that is for memory and long-term storage of memories right here. So Dr. Lowe was talking about that before. Um, and then the parietal lobes right here are for uh, math calculations and the pain and touch temperature. Our occipital lobes right here are for vision and also interpreting what you see. And our cerebellum, our cerebe cerebellum is for balance and posture and motor skills and movement. And then we have our spinal cord, which is good for our breathing, um, our heart rate control, consciousness, uh, swallowing and uh, sweating and blood pressure. Our next slide is let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food, which is an amazing um, philosophy to to live by, to um, have a lifestyle. Uh, and this is really what my, my philosophy is, uh, is to eat, to feel better. Okay, so I'm going to share just a quick story about why I think food should be thy medicine and medicine should be thy food. Uh, when you get a chance, go to my TED Talk, which is Mindful Eating with Mayo, when you're finished with this, but not right now. Um, and it's a story about my nephew and how he came to stay with me and he was diagnosed with ADHD and was taking medication. I changed the way he was eating and, uh, and he actually ultimately changed his grades. So that is one of the reasons why I do what I do and I love what I do. Um, and from that became, because success always starts with a healthy brain. Okay, we're gonna go through the bright minds, but I'm going to go through blood flow, inflammation, genetics, uh, mental health, and neurohormones. So when you get a chance, get yourself a piece of paper because we are gonna go through a lot of information. All right, so when it comes to bright minds, there's no sugar coating here because number one, it's not good for the brain. And number two, people who know me know that I don't sugarcoat anything. So it's a little bit more uh, about a tough love, uh, but it's about being efficient and also results oriented plan. So when it comes to blood flow, we have to think of a much bigger picture here. So if you could close your eyes. Now, can you imagine a beautiful forest? See the sun rays through the trees bouncing off the earth. There are three amazing trees right in front of you and they're shaped in a perfect triangle because they're there to support each other. Okay, can you see them? All right, okay, they represent the heart, the brain and your libido. If there's a problem with one of them, one of those trees in that perfect triangle, there is a problem in all of them. 
or there's a little bit of trouble. How about that? So please play, pay close attention to my presentation. I'm going to be suggesting a lot of the same foods that are associated with brain health. And the reason why is because you should be putting them in your body. So this should give you a clue to put these foods on your grocery list as staple foods to have with you at your home for your family to grab and go. Okay, ready? We're gonna go to next. Inflammation, we're gonna start with I. So inflammation comes from the word, uh, Latin word to set a fire. Chronic inflammation is like you have fire inside your body that is destroying your organs. So as you can see, foods that cause chronic inflammation are those high omega-6 vegetables like corn and soybeans. And you have the same oils, the canola, the cottonseed, the corn, and the soybean. Sugars um, and obviously foods that turn into sugar. Grain-fed meats are also a source of omega-6s. So you wanna choose grass-fed. Processed meats, um, obviously foreign, those nitro, nitrosamines, which are carcinogenic. Uh, food additives and colorings. So you have your aspartame and your MSG. Those are all creating chronic inflammation in your body. And you know, anything that disrupts the gut lining, like we were just talking, or Dr. Lowe was just talking about was that wheat. It's really, really bad for us. Okay, so to decrease inflammation, we got to put those omega-3 fatty acids in our body. So which they increase the blood flow and they slow the brain atrophy, right? So Dr. Amen has an amazing one from Brain MD. It's called Omega-3 Power. Um, you need, if you don't taking omega-3s, you need to order this one. This one is amazing. Um, this one, you have to get it. It's omega-3 power. It's, it's a, it's a no brainer. Okay. So anti-inflammatory spices are your turmeric, your cayenne, ginger and cloves and cinnamon and oregano. So those are just all warming spices, right? So those start to heat the body up. Um, and then you see rosemary, sage and fennel. Uh, and then uh, tart cherry juice decreases level of inflammation um, in a heartbeat, actually. So these are all great to take and eat um, every single day. You can get the walnut, so you can get the uh, flax seeds and chia, put that in your, your trail mix. Sockeyed salmon, oh, they're just so amazing. Okay, so now we're going to go with the G for our, the epigenetics as well. So they are turned on and turned off by habits that we create, right? So here's a little tough love. So stop blaming your genes. So, you know, as we say, the, the study shows that only genetics predict about 20 to 30%, while 70 to 80% actually is our lifestyle choices and our environmental factors. I've been doing a lot of research on the whole hereditary and the diabetes and the obesity thing. So the type one diabetes could be within that 20 to 30%, which it, it, it is, but the type two is not hereditary. So stop saying it's genetics because it's not. So you are responsible for what you put into your mouth. Diet, stress, toxins, and prenatal nutrition actually all affect our activity of genes, which is what Dr. Lowe was speaking of. So the um, generational no nutrition. So that's again, what we're talking about. Um, and if there's dementia in your family, be serious about your brain health right now. So get tested, uh, the APOE genes, um, you know, you can get a test for that and you can make an appointment at your local AMA clinic to get your brain spec imaging done. Um, next slide. Okay. To have a better brain, you got to stop eating foods that increase the plaque, right? So we have that plaque in the brain that Dr. Lowe was speaking of. So you want to stop eating the uh, every night kind of fast food pizza pancake with syrup and steak and potato meal plan. Um, stop with the processed cheeses and the microwave popcorn. They start, you know, they all contain that diacetyl, which is that chemical that increases the plaque that Dr. Lowe was speaking of. Next. Okay, so these are the ones that obviously you want to consume that decrease our plaque and increase, um, increase circulation. So again, you see the sockeye salmons here. 
the blueberries, apples and cherries, you know, curry is amazing. It's so delicious. You can have vegetable curry, you can have chicken curry, you can have any kind of curry you want. Uh, kale, onions, cabbage. So these are all amazing to keep on hand constantly. They're in season right now too. And so with coffee, I'm okay with coffee, but it's gotta be black and it has to be organic. <laughs> and you only have a maximum of two cups. Uh, and here's the spices again, those spices that are so amazing. Um, they're the warming spices. Oh, and actually, um, here's, a, here's a supplement too for saffron. Dr. Amen has an amazing supplement. It says Happy Saffron Plus. It's good for your mood as well. Okay, our next slide. Okay, M for mental health, but we're going to talk about food and mood and connection and cravings. So it's obviously, um, you know, well known that unhealthy eating patterns can cause mood swings, right? Blood sugar fluctuations, nutritional imbalances are often to blame. It's almost like that roller coaster um, of sugar blues, right? You're up, you're down, you're up, you're down. <laughs> um, and they lead to low energy and irritability, right? So nutritional deficiencies is actually a big issue. So low levels of zinc, iron, the B vitamins, magnesium, um, actually magnesium chewables, brain MD, it's got a good one. Um, and also, uh, you know, your D, obviously your D. So everybody's pretty much low in D. 95% of America is low in D. And your omega-3 fatty acids are all associated with um, moodiness, decreased energy, lack of focus, and also those, so there's a trifecta. So your B, your D, your magnesium, and um, D, B, magnesium, and zinc. So if you don't have those, those are almost like, if you're not normal or optimal, those can lead to mental health um, um, issues. So make positive changes to improve your eating to support your mental health, right? So you wanna eat three meals and two snacks. Uh, make sure you include protein at every meal and make sure it's quality protein uh, every meal. You wanna eat from the rainbow, uh, drink plenty of fluids, especially water, right? So half your body weight in ounces. So I weigh 140 pounds. So I'm gonna drink 70 ounces of water, but um, no more than 125 ounces just because of the imbalances, right? And they always say we need extra, ex get, reg get regular exercise. But I just say, love what you do. So if you love gardening, you love yoga, you love dancing, do more of it. That's what I say anyway. Next slide, okay. So these are all a part of our, um, our energy. So dopamine, you wanna focus uh, and get more energy. You wanna eat for energy. So again, make sure you're getting high quality protein at each meal. So these are just some, um, you know, like lima beans, lentils, and black beans. These are all just high in um, protein. These are delicious um, trout, you know, eggs. Eat the whole egg, it's a complete protein. It's amazing. Uh, you got trail mix, right? With nuts, Brazil nuts, seeds such as chia, pumpkin, and sesame. Oh, and then vegetables that have high quality protein uh, like broccoli and spinach. And then drink green tea. And then spices to support dopamine are your saffron again, right? Saffron plus, plus curcumin, which is your uh, turmeric as well. Uh, and then peppermint and cinnamon. Okay, serotonin. So these are the ones that are uh, good for all around happiness, uh, for mood, sleep, pain, and cravings. So the question is, did you know that just about 90% of all our ser serotonin is made in our gut? So if you're suffering from digestive issues, you may have a little bit of a serotonin imbalance. So also serotonin is a co well, common cause of depression and anxiety, right? So people who are naturally low in serotonin often crave carbohydrates, rich foods like pasta, breads, and sugar-filled cookies because carbohydrates raise the serotonin levels. But these types of foods are just temporary, right? So they increase it, the neurotransmitter just a little bit. So maybe you know someone who um, always gets stuck on like uh, negative thoughts and can't get rid of it. Well, that could be a sign of low serotonin 
or even during a, a menstrual cycle for a woman, um, the serotonin's you know a little low at that point. So um, I would say make a meal that has your half a sweet potato with turkey, your chickpeas and uh, hummus or hummus with vegetables. And then again, when your serotonin's a little low, how about having some eggs with fresh fruit in the morning? Um, and you know the the seaweed with uh, the seafood with dark leafy greens such as kale and spinach and uh, garlic in there too. And then my favorite, uh, organic dark chocolate. I love that. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. Oh, so these are anti-anxiety, right? And these fight depression foods. So again, these are all pretty much the same. We've been talking about the same foods over and over again because you need to get them in your body. So again, we have the broccoli and the spinach, um, almonds and walnuts. I mean, you can read it too, but also at the bottom, there's this maca, this root vegetable, which is a medicinal plant. This maca root is amazing. Just um, don't uh, put it in your body after three o'clock or it depends on how, um, uh, yeah, just just take my word for it. <laughs> don't, don't put it in your body after three o'clock because it's one of those, um, it gives you a lot of energy and if you're not sleeping, you probably don't want to have this. So, but put it in your coffee in the morning or um, take your capsules in the morning. But uh, maca is amazing. Okay. Okay. And for neurohormones and our brain nutritional deficiencies uh, and blood panels. So, as we know, the brain and the hormones, uh, they go both directions, right? So the brain sends out signals to instruct the body's glands to produce and release hormones. And the hormones from within the body send messengers back to the brain that influences its activities. So when our hormones are happy, are healthy and happy because they're harmonious, <laughs> you tend to feel vibrant and energetic. But when the hormones that affect the brain are off, there are imbalances everywhere. So these are the, you know, the neurohormones that we were talking about earlier that impact our brain. Um, so next, I'm just gonna go keep going because I think I'm gonna run out of time. So keep going. So the foods and spices that support our hormones are eating fiber, right? Fiber is our friend. So green beans, oatmeal, peas and carrots, seeds and Brazil nuts. And we have our testosterone boosting foods. So our olive oil, oysters, coconut, cabbage, you know, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, um, estrogen boosting foods. Okay, so thyroid, right? We're talking about thyroid earlier too. So these are amazing. The, um, I would recommend if you're having issues with your thyroid to go grab those seaweed snacks that you see everywhere. Those are amazing. And then your spices, uh, garlic, love garlic. And make sure everyone else in your household is eating the garlic because, um, you know, just, it's a lot easier that way. <laughs> uh, okay, blood flow is the number one predictor for Alzheimer's disease. And these are the foods to choose for blood flow. Arginine rich foods boost nitric oxide and blood flow. Um, again, I want you to look at the, as our, our brain, um, and our blood flow as those three trees I told you about the triangle. So you need to really have these, these foods in your body. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going because we're gonna run out of time. Uh, here's more, so fiber, vitamin C, here's our omega threes again, right? We keep talking about the same things. So cayenne pepper, here's garlic again, ginger, turmeric and cinnamon. Our foods to lose. Um, these are kind of, everyone knows what these are, the, you know, trans fats. Oh, so this is amazing. So brainhealthassessment.com. Um, take the quiz, discover what type of uh, brain type you are, and then um, Dr. Amen will send you some information on how to improve it. See your medical or health professional, someone at Amen Clinics, come here. Um, it's very inviting. We're a family. Get your blood panels done. I get mine done once a year. And I am CEO and founder of Karen Mayo Enterprises. I'm currently taking new clients. And, um, you know, as you can see, and we're into um, question time, Donna. So much again, Karen, and for all of you for being here. 
If you wish to find out more about the Amen Clinics and all of the services, evaluations, options for care and for treatment, certainly reach out and connect. You can contact our care center and speak with a, one of the specialists there at 888-340-8131 and also visit the amenclinics.com. And at this time, we'll transition to some of the questions that have come up. Let's put this one out for you, Karen. It's what are the steps to eliminate gluten or sugar for better brain health? Okay, so I, I always um, suggest my clients to go slow. So just take one thing um, that you want to take out of your body, like let's say gluten, um, and just go baby steps. You know, just take, one, take it out once and then move on to the next um, option. Go slow. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. And here was another question for Dr. Lowe. Um, what specific tests do you, do you obtain to check for toxins potentially affecting the brain? And how long does it take to remove some of the toxins? Well, it depends on the toxins. And a lot of it depends on the history. If someone tells me, oh, yeah, I grew up in the South and uh, I lived in the basement and uh, I, there was mold. All right, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna check for mold. Someone who uh, lives in the Northeast and uh, spend a lot of time outdoors, we're gonna check for Lyme disease. Um, you know, someone who uh, worked as a welder and was exposed to a lot of metallic fragments, we'll 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 test for for metals. Uh, most of the better testing is uh, done outside of traditional lab tests. For instance, if I have somebody I'm really worried about, you know, toxic metals, we're going to do the, the, the doctor's data, hair, and toxic elements test, you know. And, you know, the, the irony of this is we're here in New York State, and a lot of these um, really sophisticated uh, functional medicine uh, tests aren't even allowed to be done in New York State. So, um, you know, if you've got a loved one with, that you're concerned about Lyme or Bartonella or any of the co-infections of Lyme disease, then Igenix is the company you're going to want to test for. But, uh, you know, w when I try and order Igenix testing now, the last time I spoke to somebody in Igenix, they said, oh, Dr. Lowe, you're licensed in New York City. You can't even order the test. Because what, what we used to do is we'd order it and have it sent to a relative in New Jersey or Connecticut and they would go there and, and get the test done and send it back to hygienics. But um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, stuff going on that I, I don't, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but uh, you know, think about New York City and how much mold is in New York City. So there's a reason people don't want you to be able to get a, a, a transforming growth factor beta one or a complement C4A test, you know, because if these are high, that triggers us going down the road to, to look for mold. But um, I mean, obviously you, 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 uh, you can get stuck doing too much testing. So we try and strike a balance uh, using the history and then kind of ordering the things that we think based on the history might actually um, you know, shed some light on what we're trying to do. And another question is about sleep. And is it harmful to take melatonin supplements? What are your thoughts? Well, I, I don't think so. I, I use uh, Life Extension makes a really wonderful product, uh, Melatonin IR slash XR. It's an immediate release melatonin uh, that then, um, you know, that gets you to sleep. And then there's the extended release melatonin product that uh, um, keeps you asleep. So that's, that's a good one. Um, and I, I, I like that. Um, magnesium three and eight is also very calming. Um, Jaro makes something called MagMind. We often combine that with these melatonin products. Um, Dr. Amen has something now called Put Me to Sleep Naturally, which is just a combination of things, uh, GABA and uh, magnesium and, and uh, melatonin. Um, so, so that also works very well. So there, you know, but again, it, it, you know, if you've got some kind of functional sleep problem like sleep apnea or, um, you know, you know uh, other sleep issues, 
you really need to get a sleep study because that's really going to kind of be the beginning of trying to figure out, okay, how do I want to treat my uh, sleep issues? Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I know a number of you had additional questions. We'll look forward to uh, following up here after the clinical talk. We encourage you as well to reach out to the Amen Clinics and contact our care center. We have nine national clinics and we're here to provide other nutritional support. Please reach out um, if you're interested in connecting here with Karen and Dr. Lowe and our team. We're honored to work together as a partnership in care. If you're interested in taking a tour of the clinic, also please feel free to contact us. You can call and or email um, for in-person and or virtual visits and uh, look forward to partnering together with you and having you join us again for next time. So Karen Mayo, Dr. Lowe, thank you for being here with us and for all of you as well at home. Really excited that you could be with us um, where you're at home office um, and look forward to following up. Take care and have a great rest of the day and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.